Hi all, my name is Kelsey. I'm one of the plastic surgery PGY ones. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so today I'll be presenting on the lymphatic microsurgical preventive healing approach for lymphedema prevention after axillary lymph node dissection, particularly our experience here at Stanford. It's been estimated that lymphedema affects almost 8 million individuals in the U.S. alone, with our most common underlying cause being oncologic therapies. Over the past several decades, the focus has primarily been on lymphedema management once the sequelae of pain, heaviness, and discomfort of the affected extremity have already occurred. This includes both non-operative and operative interventions. Non-operative treatments can be time-intensive. The efficacy of the therapies also depends highly on strict patient adherence. The operative interventions require separate operations and often can't restore the limb to the pre-lymphedema state. Lympha, on the other hand, shifts the focus entirely from management towards prevention. It's a technique performed at the time of lymph node dissection, specifically, specifically axillary lymph node dissection for our patient population that connects transected lymphatic vessels to nearby veins. This raises the question, how do we identify those lymphatics? The technique of axillary reverse mapping to identify arm lymphatics emerged around 2007 in Europe. The original goal was to remove only nodes draining the breast and leave nodes draining the arm. They demonstrated the use of injecting blue dye in the arm to identify blue nodes and ducts to pre preserve lymphatic arm drainage. However, this method assumes that the upper extremity lymphatics are not involved in the metastasis of breast cancer, and that the lymphatics of the breast and upper extremity are functionally and anatomically separate, which may not necessarily be the case. A subsequent study in 2012 examined the lymphatic anatomy of the axilla by using blue dye and cadavers. It was shown that the lymphatic drainage of the upper extremity and breast are actually closely interrelated in the axilla, sharing connections in sentinel node groups in 24% of cases. So unfortunately, it's not as simple as completely preserving nodes that drain the arm and removing nodes that drain the breast, but these concepts lay the foundation for identifying arm lymphatics that could be repaired to nearby veins after transection. In our study, we offered patients with breast cancer undergoing axillary lymph node dissection with complete or partial mastectomy lympha prior to surgery with our first patient in September of 2019. Limb measurements and body composition analysis were performed pre and post-operatively. Intraoperatively, I'll go through a couple of examples of how we used ICG and lymphazurin to identify and preserve cut lymphatics for LVA. Patient demographics, operative details, complications, and outcomes were all recorded. As shown in table one, over the time period from late 2019 to now, a single plastic surgeon has performed lympha for 11 patients with various breast surgeons in the general surgery department. All of these patients had positive lymph node biopsies preoperatively revealing metastatic carcinoma, so they were definitively getting axillary lymph node dissection as part of their oncologic surgery. From a plastic surgery perspective, some of the mastectomy patients also underwent breast reconstruction with various techniques in addition to lympha. Number of LVAs performed per axilla ranged from one to four with most, recent, uh, with most patients undergoing two. The operative time for lympha portion of the case ranged from 32 to 95 minutes. Nine of the 11 patients received adjuvant radiation therapy. I thought it would be most beneficial to go through a couple of case examples. In figure one, this is an example of a right axillary lymph node dissection. For orientation, the arm is at the bottom, the breast to the right. The bright area is the arm lymphatic draining into the node. Above that is a nerve. In the middle image, you can see the equivalent image without using spy. On the right side, this is after lymphaticovenous bypass of the transected arm lymphatic to a nearby vein. You can see the patency of the anastomosis with ICG. Figure two demonstrates a second case. There were two well-defined arm lymphatics that were seen on SPI as shown in the top images. The live photo in the middle for this case really shows how SPI makes the differentiation easier. The structures are incredibly hard to differentiate otherwise. For the middle row of images in the figure, on the left, you can see two cut arm lymphatics as well as two recipient veins. The ICG correlation is on the right, which, which shows the lymphatics nice and bright. The small nearby structure that doesn't light up is uh, also a nerve. One of these anastomoses was performed end to side and the other end to end. Sometimes when the lymphatics are too small for the recipient veins, you can perform what's called an intussusception technique and dunk the lymphatics into the vein. On the bottom right, you can see the patency of both anastomoses. For post-operative monitoring, we used both circumferential limb measurements and bioimpedance spectroscopy. 
For the limb measurement technique, you use the measurements to calculate the volume of each arm at various time points using the truncated cone formula. The circumferential measurement method is widely used because it's cost effective and easy to implement. It's generally accepted that greater than 10% excess volume of the affected limb is defined as lymphedema, but it's come into question because of variance in inter and intra rater uh, variability and the difficulty in detection of early lymphedema. Bioimpedance spectroscopy allows for indirect quantification of extracellular fluid. Um, the test can be performed in several minutes and doesn't rely on the examiner. At Stanford, we use the SOZO device for bioimpedance spectroscopy. Using a ratio of impedance from each arm, it calculates a commonly used tool called the LDEX to assess risk for lymphedema. An LDEX of negative 10 to positive 10 is considered normal and above 10 diagnostic for lymphedema. In our patient population, our average number of LDAs was two with a maximum of four. Average follow-up was 8.3 months. Patients are diagnosed with lymphedema if they have both clinical signs and symptoms consistent with lymphedema and at least one quantitative measurement consistent with lymphedema. A few key points from our patients, none developed clinical signs of lymphedema. Patient number one demonstrates the utility of preoperative measurements. Based on post-op volume excess of 15 alone, you would suspect lymphedema, but with a baseline of 14, likely not. Patient seven had an LDEX of 16.6, but normal measurements and no clinical signs of lymphedema. Since LDEX tends to be better at detecting early lymphedema, it will be particularly useful to follow that patient's measurements over time. However, even if one out of 11 patients develop lymphedema, which is about 9%, this is significantly lower than the expected 40% of uh, patients that develop lymphedema after axillary lymph node dissection and radiation therapy without lympha. In summary, our study demonstrates that lympha is feasible and effective. Particularly, we wanted to highlight the collaborative nature of the procedure and utility of being present during dissection with the breast surgeon. In the future, larger studies will determine whether it becomes standard of care as an adjunct to axillary lymph node dissection. It may also prove useful beyond just axillary lymph node dissection with additional applications for gynecologic surgery, surgical oncology, and urologic surgery. Thank you.